Today we're going to cover R wave progression through the precordial leads, which are V1 through V6, as well as the hexaxial leads, which are 1, 2, 3, AVR, AVL, and AVF. We're going to talk about directions of the QRS complexes in each one of those, and we're going to discuss the difference between a vector and an axis in the heart, how you determine a mean electrical axis, as well as give you some practice on axis deviations. In the end of the presentation I will also discuss the causes of different axis deviations. Depolarization occurs in the heart in a three-dimensional process. When we look at an EKG we are actually looking at a two-dimensional result or a two-dimensional readout of a three-dimensional process. We just have to remember that whenever we look at the EKG, that's what we're looking at is a two-dimensional interpretation. Having 12 views of the heart or having a 12-lead EKG gives us an opportunity to reconstruct this three-dimensional pathway the heart takes when it depolarizes. To get this three-dimensional space, we look at the hexaxial leads. The hexaxial leads are one AVL, 2, 3, and AVF, AVR also, and I'll talk a little bit about AVR because a lot of people question why do we even have an AVR, so I'm going to give you a couple reasons for that. But those six leads right there will give you an up, down, and left, right pathway or direction of depolarization. We can use V1 through V6, which is right along here. We can use these right here to determine a an anterior posterior or a front back depolarization pattern. I'm not going to discuss that today. What I am going to discuss though is the up, down, and left, right depolarization using the hexaxial leads. So because of these 12 views, we can determine the spatial orientation of the electrical direction. Now just because the electrical direction might be outside of its normal pathway does not necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. Most of the time it tells us that there's something going on. It could be a physiologic change or it could be what we would call a pathologic change. A pathologic change would be bad. So first let's discuss R wave progression. I'm going to talk first about R wave progression through the hexaxial leads, then I'm going to talk about R wave progression through the precordial leads. What exactly I mean by R wave progression is if you remember how an EKG is laid out in a horizontal view, you have lead one, then you have lead two, then you will have lead three, then up here you have AVR, AVL, and AVF. The other six leads over here you're gonna have V1 through V6 and I'll get to those here in a little bit. Let's not worry about those right now though. The normal R wave or the normal QRS complex I should say, if you look here at AVL, here's your baseline that goes across right here Notice that your R wave or your QRS complex is primarily positive. That means that most of the QRS complex is above baseline. Look at lead 1, 2, 3, and AVF, as well as AVL. Each one of these QRSs are positively deflected. What this tells me is that this is a normal R wave progression through the hexaxial leads. AVR, on the other hand, is always going to be negative in a normal hexaxial R wave progression. So to summarize, lead 1, 2, 3 should have a positive deflection of the QRS complex, and AVR should have a negative deflection of the QRS complex, AVL should have a positive, and AVS should have a positive. This brings me to another topic that I'm going to go ahead and breach the subject now, but we're going to talk more about it later in bundle branch and fascicular blocks. What I'm going to talk about is septal depolarization. When I talk about septal depolarization, I'm talking about depolarization through the interventricular septum. For me to further discuss this, I'm going to go ahead and just do a brief review of the electrical components of the ventricles real quick. The ventricular electrical components consist of somewhere up here you're going to have your AV node, then you're going to have what's called the bundle 
of his the proper pronunciation of this is hiss like what a snake does it's not bundle of his what happens is the hiss bundle will then bifurcate into the right and left bundle branches now that's true but it's not entirely accurate there are three fascicles that actually come off of the left bundle branch there is what's called the posterior fascicle there's also an anterior fascicle and there is a very small septal fascicle that you that will also come off of the left bundle branch and this right here is your little septal fascicle right here what this septal fascicle does is it causes the interventricular septum to begin depolarizing on the left side of the septum and then the depolarization wave travels towards the right side now this is actually up here where it occurs it doesn't occur this far down but I think you get the picture. So what we see here is if you have a normal septal depolarization, since you have electricity traveling away from lead 1 and lead AVL, that will give you something called a cute petite little Q wave in the lateral leads. Notice there's are Q waves there. In the ideal setting, there is no Q wave in the inferior leads. Now, if you do have Q waves in the inferior lead, sometimes you do, and it's not a big deal. But normally, for normal septal depolarization to occur, you will have depolarization that travels from the left side of the septum to the right side of the septum, and you will be able to see this as cute, petite, little Q waves in the lateral leads. What happens in abnormal septal depolarization? Well, let's say that you have a you have your AV node here, you have your His bundle here, and then you have your right bundle branch and your left bundle branch with your anterior and posterior fascicles as well as your septal fascicle. What will happen is if this area up here is blocking the left bundle branch, then you're going to have septal depolarization that occurs on the right side of the septum and then travels towards the left side of the septum. This is abnormal you are supposed to depolarize from left to right. That's what you're supposed to do, giving you the cute petite little Q waves. If you depolarize from right to left, this will eliminate these cute petite little Q waves. This is an example of a normal hexaxial R wave progression. Just remember, lead one should be positive, lead two should be positive, lead 3 should be positive, AVR should be negative, AVL should be positive, whoops, that's supposed to be positive, and AVF should be positive. And these are all positive, so this would be considered a normal R wave progression through the hexaxial leads. Let's look at an abnormal. This would be considered abnormal R wave progression. If you look up here in lead one, you're supposed to be primarily positive, but you're not. You're actually primarily negative here. If you were to count the up and down boxes and subtract, you would see that you would end up with a negative number. Let's look at lead two. Lead two is positive. Lead three is positive. AVR is primarily negative. AVL is supposed to be primarily positive, but it's not. It is actually negative. AVF is primarily positive. This would be considered a poor R wave progression. You could even put abnormal R wave progression. Anything along those lines. Now, R wave progression through the precordial leads. R wave progression through the precordial leads, a little bit different, but still pretty simple as well. Most textbooks that you start reading will tell you that when you look at R wave progression through the precordial leads, you're primarily going to look at V1 through V4. That is true, but other books, a few books, actually include V5 and V6. So let's look at what our wave progression through the precordial leads should look like. Now, 
please remember when we talk about our way progression we're talking about is the QRS primarily positive or primarily negative we're not talking about the literal size of the R wave not talking about that at all if you look at the R wave progression I have heard in the past that V1 and V2 should be little little V4 and V5 should be I'm sorry V3 and V4 should be medium medium V5 and V6 should be big big I don't want you to use that delete it don't use it it is okay to use whenever you're first learning but we want to kind of go past that so what I want you to see in an R wave progression V1 and V2 should be primarily negative V3 and V4 should be what we call transition it's supposed to be an R should be a transition V5 and V6 should be primarily positive now the V1 through V4 thing that a lot of books talk about is V1 should be negative V4 should be positive that's the way it should be but what I want you to understand is that V1 and V2 should be negative V3 and V4 is where you should be transitioning from negative to positive V5 and V6 should be positive what happens if you transition over here in V4 to V5 that's just considered a normal R wave progression with a late transition what happens if you transition over here in V2 and V3 well you're starting out primarily negative you're ending up primarily positive here would just be an early transition for example so let's look at a couple of EKGs with just the precordial leads V1 through V6 and normal and abnormal R wave progressions this would be an EKG with, with what we would call a normal R wave progression remember V1 should start out primarily negative and it is V6 should end up primarily positive and it is so let's look at our process here we have primarily negative in V1 negative in V2 primarily negative in V3 and then we transition to positive in V4 positive in V5 and positive in V6 this would be considered an EKG with a normal R wave progression on 12 leads you might actually see it printed as good R wave progression or G R W P that's an acceptable term as well let's look at an EKG with an abnormal or a poor R wave progression here is a 12 lead with just the precordial leads again and it is a poor R wave progression how is it a poor R wave progression well you're supposed to start out primarily negative and you don't you start out primarily positive you end up primarily positive but there is no transition it looks like in this one you go from positive this one might be positive I'd have to count all the ups and downs but it might also be biphasic as well V3 is primarily positive V4 is primarily positive well only positive V5 is primarily positive and V6 is primarily positive if there is a transition it goes from positive to biphasic back to positive so there's no transitioning from negative to positive what this tells me is that this is a poor R wave progression now you can abbreviate this as P R W P poor R wave progression if you have a 12 lead that does have a poor R wave progression that we will discuss later how you interpret this 12 lead I can tell you why right now this 12 lead has a poor R wave progression but I want you to understand that it is a poor R wave progression later we will discuss why it's a poor R wave progression vectors and axis determination now we're going to discuss the difference between vectors and axis when we're talking about a vector what we're talking about is a diagrammatic method that is illustrating the direction and the strength of an electrical impulse now how we determine this is this is considered for one cardiac cell if you remember in a cardiac cell 
generally speaking, I'm just going to draw out a cardiac cell here. Generally speaking, you're going to have your cardiac cell that's going to be connected to another cardiac cell. Well, if it's all in a straight line, it's pretty easy. But if it's curved, it kind of changes where you're going. This depolarization, if you start, if your depolarization is going in this direction, what will happen is as you depolarize this cell, this is giving you a vector of a particular direction. What happens if your cardiac cell, as it comes to the junction, because it's part of the heart where it curves, it starts curving this way? Well, this depolarization is going to give you a vector in that direction. What direction is this depolarization going to occur? It's actually going to occur in that direction. So now we have two different vectors. If you average out these, all of these vectors right here, let's say that this one depolarizes in this direction as well, this will give you, these four directions will give you what we call a mean electrical axis. The heart has millions of vectors that depolarize per cardiac cycle, basically. If you can see on the picture here, there's depolarizations that are heading in that direction, that direction, there's one that's traveling up here, one just traveling down here, some are traveling down that way. Uh, right here, some are traveling actually in this direction. They're all over the place. Each one of these depolarizations is considered a depolarization of individual cells. So let's look at it this way. If you have two cells, and let's say that each one of these arrows here is considered a cell, a depolarizing cell, if you have two cardiac cells that are depolarizing in the opposite direction, that is going to give you a net vector of zero. That is your net vector. What happens if you have two cardiac cells traveling in the same direction? Well, that's going to basically amplify the electrical activity, so that is going to give you a large net vector. We do have some cells that are kind of sort of traveling in the same direction. In this case, they're both traveling up, but this one is traveling more towards the left. This one is traveling more towards the right. But generally speaking, they're both traveling up. So that's going to give us an upward net vector. But notice that even though the vectors themselves are twos, your overall net vector is not as powerful because you're losing amplitude or you're losing some net vector as you travel away from each other. So this is also going to be your net vector. If we average out all of these vectors here, that will give us a mean electrical axis. If we average out all of these vectors, what we end up with is a general depolarization of the heart which gives us the mean electrical axis. As you can see here, this is a picture with all these little arrows traveling in all these different directions, but this big puppy right here, this is your mean electrical axis. To re-illustrate one more time, just in case you didn't understand the difference between vectors and axis, I like to use a map, as it were. This makes it a little bit easier for me. Let's say that we're going to start way up here. This is a map of Las Vegas. We're starting way up here at Lake Mead Boulevard and Highway 95. Now we're going to need to get to Eastern and Desert End Road right here. This is our eventual target. We're taking surface streets. Now if we were to be in a chopper or something, it'd be pretty straightforward. We could just fly straight down and have not, not have a problem. But we're going to have to take surface streets. So first we're going to start here at Lake Mead and Highway 95. We're going to travel southbound first. Then we're going to hit this rainbow curve here. Then we're going to travel eastbound. And then we're going to do this little divot here. Then we're going to hit the interchange. And then we're going to start traveling kind of a southwesterly direction a little bit before we start traveling south again. Then we're going to start traveling in another southwesterly direction until we finally get down to Sahara. And then I'm going to exit off of Sahara Avenue. And now I'm traveling back east again. And then when I get over here to Sahara and Eastern, then I'm going to start traveling south again. Each one of these little surface street directions is considered a vector. If we were to average all the distances, what we would end up with is a general mean electrical axis or a general direction of southeast. This would be considered our mean electrical axis, southeast. Each one of these little 
Generally speaking, the mean electrical axis follows this general direction. Down to the left and towards the front of the body. This is the direction that it is supposed to travel as a normal direction. If it travels any other direction, it is considered an abnormal depolarization. Why do we care about axis deviations? Well, like I said before, any deviation away from its normal path is indicative of some kind of abnormality in the conduction system. Usually this deviation is caused by a problem with the myocardium. What are some problems that we could have with the myocardium that would cause this axis deviation? Generally speaking, some things that could occur and outside of just saying a general disease process, specifically it could be an MI or myocardial infarction. What that means is if you have your little heart right here, if your mean electrical axis is traveling in this direction, generally speaking, if I have a heart attack on this side, what's going to happen to all of my vectors on this area that had the heart attack? Well, these vectors aren't going to play a role in the average anymore because they're dead. So what will happen is my electricity will then, my axis will then kind of shift in this direction. What happens if I have an inferior wall MI right here? What happens to all these vectors? they're not influencing the axis anymore so what would happen here is my axis would no longer go down and left to the front it might travel in this direction over here so an MI can change the axis the overall axis some other things that could change the overall axis hypertrophies Hypertrophies could cause a change in the axis because basically a hypertrophy is an enlargement of the muscle. So if we have an enlargement of the left ventricle over here, what happens is the muscle gets bigger. Because it gets bigger, it uses more electricity, which means it's going to now pull the axis up towards the left ventricular side. Even though it's traveling in this direction, on the piece of paper we're going to see it traveling more in this direction. At the same time, it, let's say we have right ventricular hypertrophy. It's going to pull because there's more electricity because it's a larger muscle, or it's, a lar it's going to appear to be a larger muscle. It's going to have more electrical influence over the axis. So hypertrophies are going to pull the axis in the direction. MIs are usually going to push the uh, electrical axis away from itself. Some other things that could occur is something like a mechanical shift. So usually obese people or pregnant women will have larger abdomens, for example, and it will push the abdominal contents up a little bit and it will cause the heart to mechanically shift inside the chest. What that means is you can have a normal axis but on paper it's going to appear that it is deviated when in reality it's a mechanical shift. It's because the heart mechanically shifted its position in the chest. Those are just a couple of examples that would cause a, a deviation of the myocardium. Oh, also uh, bundle branch blocks or something we'll cover later, fascicular blocks. These can also change the direction of the axis. Determining the axis. There's a couple of different methods that you can use to determine the axis and I'm going to show you a shortcut method after I show you how we actually determine the QRS axis. What you will need to determine an axis is, well, obviously you're going to need a 12 lead. And then you're also going to need some calipers. The reason you need calipers is because it makes it a lot easier to count little boxes if you use a calipers. You're going to need a straight edge because you're going to plot points on this hexaxial reference plane right here, which is what the next thing was, hexaxial reference plane. Now I drew this one out right here. I got a little ruler and started going crazy with with a protractor and everything and drew one out so 
it was a little bit easier for me to explain how you determine an axis. One thing I want to point out about this hexaxial reference plane. First of all, notice that lead 1 is over here and it's circled. This means that this is the positive electrode. AVL, this is the positive electrode. 2, 3, and AVF are down here, and these are the positive electrodes, and of course, R is way up here. To determine the axis, the two leads that we're going to use is lead 1 and lead AVF. The reason that we use those two is you have to plot axis on perpendicular leads. If you use AVL, for example, you can't use AVF. You have to use lead two. Well, we're going to kind of stick with the traditional Cartesian plane. That way, we can easily plot left, down, up, right axis to determine what the axis is in the hexaxial leads. One other thing I want to point out, in the normal Cartesian plane, if you travel this direction, it's positive. If you travel this direction from your central terminal, which is right here, it's going to be negative. This is true. But in this case, the up-down is actually backwards. So if you were to travel up on this particular reference plane, this is going to be your negative number. If you travel down, this is going to be your positive number. In the normal, traditional, mathematical Cartesian plane, that's backwards. So please remember, if your AVF number, and I'll explain how you get that here in a minute, if your AVF number is positive, you have to go down on the hexaxial reference plane. Since we know that a normal depolarization occurs down to the left and to the front of the body, we can now use this hexaxial reference plane to determine if the axis is a normal axis, a left, a right, or an indeterminate axis direction. That is the direction of the depolarization. So what they did was they broke the hexaxial reference plane into four quads. What I decided to do was I decided to go ahead and keep it as four quadrants. Other people, other books kind of go outside of a four quadrant method. I like to keep it four quadrants. Keep it simple. You can learn the variations later if you want to. A normal axis goes from zero degrees right here around here to positive 90 degrees. Anywhere that you land in your little plotting that I'll show you here in a minute that lands anywhere here is considered a normal axis. This is not a normal axis deviation because if it's a deviation it's not normal. So don't put normal axis deviation. You will be marked wrong for that if you put that down on a test. A right axis deviation is if you plot the axis from a positive 91 around here to a positive negative 180. This would be a right axis deviation. You can abbreviate it as RAD. That's an acceptable abbreviation. A left axis deviation has both pathologic and physiologic axis shifts. Now because the left ventricle is a larger muscle, than the right ventricle. It is not uncommon in some people, for example athletes, to have what's called a physiologic left axis deviation. So a physiologic left axis deviation goes from about negative one, notice negative one degrees, to about negative 30 degrees. Different books will say, different, will say something different. Some of them stop at negative 20, some of them stop at negative 40. I decided to stop at negative 30 because that's the angle of AVL. If you go past 30, negative 30 degrees, anywhere over here is considered pathologic. Anything that is pathologic is bad. That's not normal. So this whole yellow area here is considered a left axis deviation. Up to here is considered physiologic. Past here is considered pathologic. Finally, the negative 91 around to positive negative 180 all the way around here, this is considered indeterminate axis. 
It's also sometimes called extreme right axis deviations. Either a term, I've seen both of them, either term or fine. Indeterminate axis or extreme right axis deviation. If this doesn't make a whole lot of sense right now, be patient. I'm going to show you how to plot an axis and maybe that'll make a little bit more sense. Now let's look how we determine an axis. Step one, there's a few steps here in step one, so kind of bear with me a little bit. You want to find lead one. Here's lead one, and remember, the opposite lead we're going to use in lead one is lead AVF, because in the hexaxial reference plane, lead one went this way, and lead AVF went this way. We have to use leads that are perpendicular to each other. So let's look at lead one. We are now going to count the number of positive millimeters or positive deflection of lead one of the QRS complex. So it looks like it begins right here. So we're going to say one, two, three, four. So we're going to say the positive deflection is going to be a plus four in lead one. Now let's count the number of negative deflections of the QRS complex in lead one. In lead one, it looks like it returns back to baseline, all of this here. It's right here at baseline. So we have no negative deflections. Easy math. Plus four minus zero is going to give you a net vector of positive four. Please put positive four. Don't just put four and imply that it's positive. In this case, you should always mark a positive number or a negative number with the appropriate sign. This is the number that I'm looking for right here, the positive 4. This is what I'm going to plot on the line of lead 1 in the hexaxial reference plane. Where we start is we start right here at the central terminal, and then we will count four little boxes towards the positive. Remember, this is the positive aspect. This is the negative aspect of lead one. So let's start right here in the central terminal and let's count positive one, two, three, four. This is where our positive lead, or I'm sorry, our lead one is going to be plotted. Determining the axis step two. Basically what we're going to do is we're just going to duplicate what we did in step one with lead one and we're just going to do it in AVF. So let's look down here at AVF. Remember you have to use a perpendicular axis to lead one which is AVF. Step one we're going to count the number of positive millimeters of deflection in the QRS complex. So we'll say that this looks like to be our baseline right about here. So we're going to go one, two, that's two millimeters that looks like five millimeters and that's one two that's three millimeters right there so that's five six seven eight nine ten so we now have a positive ten as our first number the next step that we do is we count the number of negative deflections negative millimeters in lead AVF and the QRS complex this looks to be about one so I'm gonna say that's a negative one I'm gonna subtract one from uh, the number up here and I'm gonna subtract the negative one from 10 and what I'm gonna come up with is a net vector of positive 9 this is my net vector this is the number that I'm going to plot onto the Cartesian plane or I'm sorry the hexaxial reference plane this is lead 1 that's lead AVF now remember positive lead 1 was over here negative lead 1 was over here positive AVF is here, negative AVF is here. This becomes important now that we're plotting the AVF point. So as you can see here, this is our plot right here from our lead one. Let's go ahead and plot our lead AVF. We always start here at the central terminal, now it's a positive nine. AVF, this is your positive direction, this up here is your negative direction. So let's start right here and we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There is going to be your plot for your AVF mark. Now that we've plotted leads 1 and AVF, 
the first thing we need to do, and this is where your straight edge comes into play, draw a perpendicular line or a vertical line, if you want to call it, through lead one at the spot marked. So we're going to take a vertical line and we're going to draw it through lead one. The next step is to draw a perpendicular line through AVF. This is going to be a horizontal line through AVF. So we're going to take the line and we're going to draw a horizontal line through AVF. Next, you're going to draw a third line. Now, this is where you're going to draw an intersection line. You're going to start at the central terminal, which is the exact middle, through the intersection of the 1 and AVF lines that you plotted and continue the line to the edge of the circle. So what that means is you're going to start here at the central terminal, draw a line through this intersection and continue to somewhere out here at the edge of the circle. So let's go ahead and draw our line. As you can see, the line ended up out here and we're going to call this close enough to be a positive 75, I'm sorry, positive 65 degrees. Wherever your line ends up at the edge of the hexaxial plane is the axis. In this case, about 65 degrees is where our line ended up. Now let's go back to the four quadrants. If you remember the four quadrants starting here at zero from here to here down to AVF and then back up this way this was considered a normal axis. What would have happened if you were to plot your line to land somewhere over here? Well this area across here is considered a left axis deviation. You can easily call it an LAD and you would be correct. At the same time, what happens if you plotted it over here somewhere? Anywhere between a positive 91 up to the positive negative 180, this area here is considered a right axis deviation. This is how we determine an axis using the hexaxial reference plane and leads 1 and AVF. Let's go ahead and practice real quick with a couple of these just to kind of zero in on these skills. First thing we do is we take a look at lead 1 and we count the positive deflections. This one's easy because the positive deflections start right here off a of baseline. So there's 5, there's 5, that looks like 1, 2, 3. So that is a positive 13. Do we have any negatives here? Well, we do actually. We have one negative deflection right here before we hit J, the J point. So that is a negative 1. Well, 13 minus 1 is a positive 12. Now let's plot this positive 12 on the hexaxial reference plane because this positive 12 here is your net vector. So we're going to start in our central terminal right here and we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's our positive 12 right here. Let's look at AVF. Just pick any one of these down here because there is a little bit of alternating going on. In reality, the computer would probably take all of these and then average it. Well, we're not going to take the time to do that. So let's go ahead and pick one. And let's say that we pick, let's just pick this middle one here. So here's baseline. So there's going to be one there. And that looks like, we'll just call that a five. So we have a positive six. How many negatives do we have? There's one, two, three, four, five. Maybe we'll just stick with a six. We'll go with a negative six. Okay, well, positive six and negative six gives me a net vector of zero. So what that means is, and this is probably a good thing that we're doing this, what that means is my AVF is not going to go up or down at all. My AVF is going to be plotted right here. So what that did was it plotted me. I'm going to connect these two points here. There is no reason to draw any other lines other than this right here. So my axis is going to be just about zero. The computer would give me an exact number 
to tell me if it's truly a normal or a left axis deviation. But technically, a zero degree axis is considered normal. Let's look at another one and see if we can get a better axis. Let's look at this one here. Starting out with lead one, we count the number of positive deflections. One, two, three, we'll call that four. That's a positive four. Looks like we have a negative one deflection. Here's your little negative down here. This is going to give us a net vector of positive three. That's the number that we're going to plot over here on the hexaxial reference plane. We start here. There's a one, two, and three. There's our positive three. Looking at AVF, we're going to, this baseline is a little wavy, so let's use this one here, this EKG here, I'm sorry, this rhythm strip here. Let's use this QRS here. I'll get it. Let's count the positive deflections. One, two, three, so that's a positive three. How many negative deflection do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. It looks like a negative six. I'm going to end up with a negative number here. If you have a positive 3, you subtract 6, you end up with a negative 3. Our net vector is negative 3 in AVF. Now remember, AVF negative, you travel upwards to plot your point. So here's our 0 mark. Here's our central terminal. 1, 2, and 3. So there is that line right there, or that plot right there. Now we would take a straight edge. And I don't have a straight edge here, so just kind of bear with me a little bit but a straight line as straight as possible going that direction and then a straight line as much as possible going in that direction then you take another straight edge and this is going to get interesting you start here in your central terminal and you draw a straight line all the way out to the edge of your mark or of your hexaxial reference plane this is going to give me about my axis. So my axis is somewhere between negative 40 and negative 50 degrees. Remember, this quadrant here is considered a left axis deviation. You could go a step further and say, is this a pathologic or a physiologic left axis deviation? In this case, it's going to be considered a pathologic left axis deviation. What is the number itself that we're looking at? We're going to call it negative 46 degrees because we're pretty good that way. There is a way easier method to determine this and let me kind of explain what it is real quick here because once you look at it it's going to make perfect sense once you start looking at EKGs. You're still going to look at leads 1 and lead AVF. If you look at lead 1 and the QRS is pointed up in lead 1 and the QRS is pointed up in AVF this is considered a normal axis. If they are pointed together, now let me explain what I mean by the QRS is pointed together. If lead 1 is pointed down and AVF is pointed up, they're pointed towards each other or they're pointed together. If you see that lead 1 is pointed down and lead AVF is pointed up, this is considered a right axis deviation if they're pointed together. What happens if they're pointed apart? Well, what that means is if you look at lead 1 and lead 1 is pointed up and AVF is pointed down, they're pointed away from each other or pointed apart. If they're pointed apart, that would give you a left axis deviation. If they're pointed down, what that means is if lead 1 is pointed down and lead AVF is pointed down, that will give you an indeterminate or extreme right axis deviation. But that gives you an axis that is so far off the grid that who knows what it could be. The way that I remember this is very simple. I just remember the phrase right together left apart. Right together, left apart. What that tells me, I know that an up and an up in one in AVF is normal. If they're pointed together or towards each other, it's a right axis deviation. If they're pointed apart or away from each other, it's a left axis deviation. What happens if they're pointed down? That just tells me it's an, ex an extreme right or an indeterminate axis. 
The only drawback is that this doesn't give you an actual number. Do you care about having an actual number? You may want to care about having an actual number. Just because you know that the patient has a normal axis doesn't mean that nothing is going on. And the reason I say that is because if you have a person, to use simple numbers, let's say that you have a person that the computer calculated two hours ago that the axis is 17, positive 17 degrees. That is considered a normal axis. Two hours later, you show up to transport the patient who is complaining of chest pain. As you look at the sequence of 12 leads, what you find on his last 12 lead is that now your QRS axis is positive 80 degrees. Is that con still considered normal? Of course it is. Both of these are considered a normal axis. Now we're going to leave out the possibility that the 12 lead was placed differently each time that you did it. Let's pretend that each one of the electrodes were placed in the exact same spot. You now have an axis shifting. It is not deviated, but it is shifting towards the right. This could be a problem. Shifting axes towards the right, which means the axis is shifting in this direction, could mean that there's an MI going on on the left side, and the only way you can determine that is by the axis is actually changing. So while the short phrase, right together, left apart, doesn't give you an actual number, it's always a good idea to kind of keep the numbers in mind. It's always good to know the numbers, too. Now using a quick method here, let's just use the right together, left apart, really fast and it will tell you immediately if the axis is normal, right, left, or extreme. Let's look at the first 12 lead. It is, you look at lead 1 is pointed up, lead F is primarily pointed up. This is going to tell us that this EKG has a normal axis. Now what this does is if you look at lead 1, you have a positive or a positive QRS. That means that your plot is going to end up somewhere over here. AVF is a positive, so your plot is going to end up somewhere over here. That tells me that this area here, I don't know exactly where, but I know somewhere it will be normal. Let's look at another one. Right together, left apart. Let's look at lead 1 is primarily pointed down. Lead F is primarily pointed up. This means that they're pointed together or towards each other. This is going to be a right axis deviation. This is why it is a right axis deviation. Look at lead 1, primarily negative. Starting at your central terminal, you're going to be going primarily negative. Lead F is pointed up, so you're going to be primarily positive. This right here gives you a, a direction that you're going to have a right axis deviation. That's why that right together, left apart works so well. What is the actual number? I don't know. You'd have to plot the points and do the math to find out what your exact direction is. Now let's look at this one. Lead AV, I'm sorry, lead 1 is pointed up. Lead F is pointed down, right together, left apart. Since they're pointed apart, it is considered a left axis deviation. What that means is lead 1 is pointed up, so that's where this is right here. AVF is pointed down, which is a negative direction. That's going to go up on this hexaxial reference plane. Right here is your left axis deviation quadrant. Is this a physiologic or pathologic left axis deviation? We don't know. We'd have to do the math, plot the points, and find out exactly where we end up on this degrees chart over here. What I want to do now is I want to talk briefly about what causes left and right axis deviations. These are in no particular order. Just because I list it first does not mean that it is the most common cause, but all of these can cause a left axis deviation. First of all, a left axis axis deviation is normal in older or obese people it could also have a high diaphragm in pregnancy which would basically be a mechanical shift
emphysema. Something called left ventricular hypertrophy or LVH. Left anterior fascicular block or LAFB. Inferior wall MI or IWMI. That's a very common abbreviation for that. Left bundle branch blocks can sometimes cause a left axis deviation. And finally, ventricular tachycardias can also cause a left axis deviation. One thing about ventricular tachycardias, they can cause any kind of deviation. They can cause right, left, indeterminate. They could have a normal axis. I'm not sure how, but they can cause any kind of an axis shift. Now, a right axis deviation could be caused by emphysema, right ventricular hypertrophy, COPD, a left posterior fascicular block, could be caused by a right bundle branch block, and could also be caused by ventricular tachycardia. That's supposed to be a T, not a J. An indeterminate or extreme right axis deviation can be caused by ventricular tachycardia or something called a bifascicular block. Our wave progression applies to both hexaxial and precordial leads, but I do want to mention though that when the computer on the 12 lead talks about a poor R wave progression, it is primarily talking about R wave progression through the precordial leads. I only teach you hexaxial R wave progression because it's a good thing to know. It helps you better understand and interpret a 12 lead. But a poor R wave progression in the interpretation of a 12 lead is usually referring to the precordial leads only. Multiple vectors in the heart average out to find a mean electrical axis. Just remember that an individual vector is like the depolarization of a specific cell, of a single cell in the heart. Average out all of those individual directions and you end up with a mean electrical axis. The normal axis is traveling down to the front and to the left side of the body. Any deviation away from this just tells you that there is something going on. Hopefully through history or 12 lead interpretation, you'll be able to figure out what that is. The axis that we use is determined by looking at leads 1 and AVF. Those are the two simplest leads that we like to use, so those are the ones that we talk about. If you have any other questions about this, please feel free to contact your lecture instructor.